Hi there, my name is Ushin Dunny and this is Audio Talks, a bi-weekly podcast on all things audio presented to you by Harman. Every episode, we bring you some of the most interesting, innovative and inspiring people from the world of music and great audio. And today's episode is all about music and personality. From concerned parents banning heavy metal and gangster rap from the bedrooms of middle America to the Muzak Corporation promising increased productivity via audio wallpaper, society has always placed a high importance on the link between what we listen to and how we behave. But can music actually influence our personalities? And do our personalities affect the music we listen to? And what does this all mean for audio reproduction? Joining me to explore this controversial issue are three experts who can certainly tell their music for airports from their music for shopping malls. David M. Greenberg, PhD, is a psychologist, musician and researcher at the Bar Ilan University and Cambridge University. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me. Dr. Ruth Dockray is the Associate Professor of Popular Music at the University of Chester, UK. Welcome, Ruth. Hello. And Dr. Sean Olive is a multi-award winning senior fellow at Harman and a previous guest on our podcast. So welcome back, Sean. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you again. Okay, so we're going to talk about music and personality. So I thought I'd start with the biggest question. Where does musical taste come from? Well, I think um, musical taste comes from probably three different areas. Um, firstly, exposure. So what have you been exposed to um, as a, you know, from a young age? What have you had access to? And how have these musics been curated so that you understand them in you know, certain ways? So I always remember when I was growing up that you know, hearing lots of different music was so important. And having that exposure means that you can delve deeper into lots of different um, types of music. But now we have this access, which is fantastic. I remember my friends saying, I've got a mixtape for you. This is the most brilliant song you've ever heard. We were desperately trying to record it from the radio. And so I think a lot of musical tastes come from those kind of ideas of, you know, what you're exposed to and what you have access to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a relentless mixtape maker. I send one to my friends and family via my website every month. I'm actually reading this book by an uh, English music journalist called Pete Perfides called Broken Greek. And it is really a story of a childhood soundtracked and informed by mixtapes and taping your favorite song and sharing it. But I'm kind of wondering in these days, now that we have Spotify and Tidal and we have the universal jukebox, we've got access to more songs than we could possibly listen to via our mobile devices, via our high-end hi-fis at home that are connected. And this sort of means that a lot of our musical activity has become virtual, if you like. So in the old days, you know, when I was growing up, there were mods and rockers and to a lesser extent, hippies and punks or whatever. But now the tribes are quite fluid and people's identities are very much virtual. Do we think this is a a positive development, which is opening up this field of taste and music and personality? Well, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you have people who are exposed to music that they would never be exposed to. And um, they, they can find music that they need for that moment much more quickly. So if they're just getting, you know, over a breakup, uh, rather than kind of having to dig through things that they already know, there's, especially now with AI, there's, you know, it could learn your situation and your context and feed you what you need right then in that moment in time. So that's really positive. And plus, because we have headphones and earphones and all different ways to listen to music, we could be listening to it in situations that we weren't listening to it 30, 40, 50 years ago. At the same time, though, a lot of like what we've been talking about just now in the brief few minutes is about music listening and not about performing. And so in that way, um, there's a large collective aspect about music where um, listening to music virtually has made music consumption much more individualistic. And so in a way, the very like deep seated aspects of music that about social bonding and the tribal elements um, that is so part of what makes human musicality really reach our hearts and, and souls 
um, has been getting lost to a certain extent. And uh, now people are starting to find different innovative ways of how to bring that back in the virtual context. But that's how it's been um, a double-edged sword, where we have this great boom in technology and AI and ways of thinking and listening to music that we've never had before, but also the things that our great human ancestors, um, how they were using music, there's ways that that's been lost uh, in the current present time. Fascinating, fascinating. It, it kind of gives a a poignancy to this idea that we are kind of isolated and, and listening to not so much genres as AI-driven playlists, which are, quote-unquote, marketing to a sector of one. Do we think that the concept of genres of music are changing these days because we have this technology? Uh, I can take that one because I'm just fascinated by the subject because I think like before our eyes, we're seeing how genres, I think, are vanishing. I remember being a teenager and after high school, I would go to Tower Records or whatever music store and I would look at the um, different labels. And I w was studying jazz at that point. So I would go to the jazz section. Maybe there was like some avant-garde jazz or smooth jazz. I would typically go to the avant-garde jazz and then that's how I would select the music. And then I'd have my album for the week or the, for the couple of weeks and listen. And now that's like completely transformed. And um, especially now with data-driven approaches, uh, we see um, Spotify, companies like Race Note that are doing musical categorization, um, move away from genres and now focusing a lot more on, and even in the research academic areas, we've been focusing on styles, um, looking at broad styles of, of music categorization and classification. And also um, one of my topics that are um, I'm really fascinated about it is actual features, the specific features and pinpointing when people... Like not if they love rock or uh, jazz or pop, but how much do people like sad music or how much do they like the depth in music and the um, certain aspects of positive emotions and mystical and spiritual elements and all those types of realms. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. And I'm wondering if I could bring in yourself, Sean, we've been talking about this concept of, of genres and often we think of certain music genres having a character. But now what we're hearing is the concept of genres is being dissolved. We're kind of not so much talking about listening on a rock sound system or a R&B sound system as a sound system that maybe needs to be more agile and responsive to how we're feeling. I'm curious to get your take on how maybe we listen to music, the playback equipment, how that is changing as our relationship with these monolithic ideas of genres is changing and is audio technology moving along the same journey as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in my world, the audio world, <clears throat> historically people have referred to systems as, Oh, this system is good for jazz. This is good for classical. This is a, this is good for rap. In my experience, there, there is no such thing. The character of the music is basically determined when it's recorded, when it's produced. And hmm. if, if rap music is supposed to have more bass, it's, it's in the recording. So this notion that you should design the system to have more bass, if you listen to rap music, I think is false. And, and we see that with, for example, a company known as Beats, which had a huge influence early on in the headphone, uh, 2012, 2013. And they were known as a brand that had a, an audio personality for heavy bass music. What we found is over time, if you measure a Beats headphone in 2014 and measure one today, it's a much more neutral sonic personality. It's, it's closer to what we call the Harman target, which is a response of a headphone that's deemed to be very accurate and neutral and good for all genres of music. So I think today you, you want uh, equipment that can reproduce all kinds of music. And that's the kind of system that most music's produced on. It's it's a neutral studio monitor. That's that's how it was monitored when it was made. So it makes sense to have a similar kind of equipment when you're listening to it. I remember uh, reading somewhere that you investigated a lot of headphones and speakers and you found that there was a huge disparity between what they cost to the consumer and the actual quality that they received. So this, we, we were studying this for about eight, over the course of eight years. So it's, it's more or less completed now. And what we found is that people like a very accurate neutral sound, similar to speakers, which we've done studies 
previously. And you're right, the correlation between price and sound quality was about 0.2, uh, correlation efficient, but 0.2. So one would be perfect correlation. Uh, mm-hmm. This is almost you know, very weak or no correlation. So, uh, so what we found uh, since we started publishing this work is that the industry is very quickly moving towards the results of our study, which found that people like this accurate uh, tonal balance. And we see this curve that we developed now being adopted into test and measurement equipment uh, so that people who are designing headphones actually have more or less adopted our curve as, as the standard. So I think what you'll see in the next few years is headphones will that this consistency and lack of correlation between quality and price is going to disappear and you'll see better, better headphones at, at lower prices. Excellent. Good news. I was hoping to hear something like that. That's uh, <laughs> that's good work. So I'd, I'd like to come back to the overlap between musical styles and genres, if you like, and personalities. How do we all think that this concept of musical genres or musical styles relates to our identities and personalities? Well, I certainly think when we think of genre, uh, we can break genre down into, you know, areas that we can categorize these musics. So, for example, genre can encapsulate the sonic attributes, um, the musical characteristics. It can capture um, behavior. So how do we behave when we listen to it, when we participate, the artists themselves? So things like headbanging. And also semiotics, so things like what does it look like? What does a genre look like? What are the clothes we're wearing? What are those album covers like? And then the social and ideological factors. What do you tap into? What do you love the most about that genre? Now, these are really broad and we love to stereotype, but they're a great starting point. And I think when you are growing up and you're trying to find an identity, you tap into those things. What do, I, what do I wear? Well, that's kind of like being in a heavy metal band or I love to go and, you know, listen to loads of dance music. So I'm going to find some great EDM. So maybe what we're doing is we're tapping into those characteristics of the genre and seeing what type of personality we are. But, you know, even unconsciously finding those connections. But certainly I think I think that's a great starting point for understanding genre. Um, and and that link between how we are, how we behave ourselves, and what we get from it, because there's got to be a reaction, there's got to be a kind of preference, because we're looking for a response, that emotional response. Really interesting, thank you. And um, do we think there's also a behavioural lens that we can look through when we're analysing musical preferences? Has anybody in their research come across a correlation between behaviour and preferred music. So um, this conversation is reminding me of, um, it's not so much about music listening, but about performance and personality, where um, I had a music lesson uh, several years ago with uh, one of my favorite living musicians named Joey Weissenberg, who's a singer-songwriter. And we never met at all, uh, really, or had any serious conversation before the lesson. And uh, we first thing that we did, we kind of sat, I brought my saxophone out and he was playing guitar and we just started to improvise for about 20 minutes. It felt like an hour, but it was just 20 minutes. And the after we, we kind of finished playing, the first thing that we kind of were silent for a couple of seconds. And then the first thing that he said to me is like, wow, you, you've lived a long life. You've been on a journey. And so what he was saying wow. to me was, you know, through your music, I, I, I see who you are. I see the, the characteristics. I see your lived experience. And I think the same thing happens in reverse when we're listening to an artist and we connect deeply with, with an artist. So whether um, it's I'm listening to John Coltrane or someone's listening to uh, their, you know, Joni Mitchell or ACDC, there's something that's being communicated from the actual qualities of the music um, and also about other aspects like behavioral, what you were saying about behavioral aspects about the music. We just did a study that came out a few months ago where we combined a bunch of different large data sets. I think there were about 80,000 people in total. And essentially we want to ask the question of, is there an element of music that's driving musical preferences beyond the actual musical features and qualities? So like Ruth said, there's 
um, sonic qualities, emotional qualities. And what we wanted to do in the study was control for all of that. And we wanted to see how the personality of the listener matched with the persona of the artist. And what we found was that the closer that these two things fit, the, the personality of the listener and the persona of the artist, um, that was driving the preferences, um, even beyond the actual qualities of the music. Um, so there's all these other information that we're taking in about who the person is based off of how they may be dressing, how they appear in the media, and just from the sound of their voice. Fascinating. My goodness. Sean, I'm, I'm wondering, does this kind of open up the area of the quality of audio reproduction? Is that an important element to people identifying emotionally with a performance and enjoying a piece of music? We, when we were doing a study on headphones, we looked at, uh, uh, at some point, we gave them a perfectly neutral headphone and we had people adjust the bass and treble. And what we found that you know, 64% of the people would just leave it alone, but a certain segment of people would turn the bass up anywhere between three and six dB, which is quite a lot. And it tended to be males, younger males uh, versus females. And uh, as people got older or more experienced, they would turn it down. And in fact, at, at the upper end of age, people would turn uh, the bass way down and turn the treble up. And we think that was related to hearing loss, age-related hearing loss. So anyways, there seems to be a, a relationship between how extroverted you are and whether you're male and, and your age and how much bass you like. So that, that may be an important element uh, if you're designing an audio system aimed at a particular age. And in fact, JBL is a very youth-oriented brand. And with JBL headphones, we actually add an extra 2 dB bass because we're wow. aiming aiming at that uh, that particular uh, demographic that uh, our data shows they want to hear a little extra bass. Yeah, totally. And you've got the special editions with people like Armand van Buren. So are they designed with the musician's persona in mind? Uh, is, is the sonic curve tailored towards that particular kind of music? Exactly. Uh, we went to these different musicians and had them adjust the headphone we also tested their speakers in the in the studio, and uh, with the software, you can tune in those those tastes. Ruth, I'd like to come back to you for a minute. Uh, you write some really interesting papers. I've been kind of immersing myself a bit in your back catalogue there, and there was one called Tamaglitchi, a pilot study of anthropomorphism and nonverbal sound. I'm curious, because you were talking about this idea of a sound having a personality for an inanimate object, like a Tamagotchi. What do you think this world of genres broken down into categories means for brands who wish to develop a personality? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, what we found was in order to give something more character and to sort of elicit a more empathetic response to add a sonic signature, so to speak, um, can really make something come alive. And so, you know, from the sort of little Pixar lamp that you see, you know, where it has this, these noises, it, it becomes alive. And we look at Wally now, you know, yeah. that, that little sort of robot, he's just got a personality of his own because of the sounds they use. And now everybody's talking to their Alexa and little round dots and things like this. I don't think we are quite understanding how much we anthropomorphize in everyday objects. And mm -hmm. where you're using almost like sonic branding, we, you know, we, we think of what things look like, images, logos. Sound can do exactly that and it can add a sense of um, personality to, to what it is you're looking at. So how you break that down in terms of genre is very interesting because I think, as we were saying before, genre is such a wide form of categorizing music. I think we need to break it down even further to the point where we're looking at probably more specific musical characteristics. So those people that really like the Aeolian mode, what does that mean? Well, there's a little bit of a sadness there, or it could be um, those three repeated notes that you find, or is it somebody who likes a really great bass line? So is that the sort of things that we can narrow down to these sort of what we call museums, um, like a little oh. sort of thing that you understand when you hear it? It's the smallest component that 
associate so many things with it. And if we ascribe that to a to an object, is that does you know does that help? So again, I don't have the answers, but I think we're moving towards maybe understanding more about how we are anthropomorphizing things on a daily basis and how sound helps to do that. We actually had a couple of very interesting guests on a previous episode of Audio Talks who were uh, Suzanne Chani, who invented the Coca-Cola pop and pour sound and was a, is an absolute pioneer of audio branding. And uh, Moraine Rosamond from Massive Music, uh, who's just designed the um, soundtrack for the uh, tram system in Amsterdam. So whenever you get on and off a tram in Amsterdam, uh, it's his company has designed these little sounds. And uh, they bring such personality to inanimate objects. It's a fascinating field. And I think your white paper about Tamaglitchi was very interesting in that respect. So kind of staying with this overlap of technology and music, we have more access to more data and more technology than we ever have before in terms of how we interact with music. Have you found that this has been an aid to help you analyze and understand people's relationship with music and um, you know have you had any findings in that field it's it's a brand new frontier that um on the one hand we have companies that have a tremendous amount of data and on the other hand there's academics at universities trying to get their hands on that similar data and some of the a b testing that these companies are doing they could write a dissertation in two hours based on the data that they have. And someone at a university, a student is spending years, you know, as trying to answer a similar question. So ultimately yeah. what I found is that it's really important for academia and industry to be communicating with each other um, and uh, that to collaborate with each other. And there's been a lot of fruitful collaborations that have emerged just over the past few years. Um, you know, for example, with Spotify, I've been, was consulting with them for several years, and we just uh, published a study this summer um, looking at personality and Spotify listening. We basically wanted to be able to predict something called the big five personality traits, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism based off of Spotify listening histories. And we found that we had a pretty, we used machine learning and were able to build um, some models that had really high predictive accuracy to the point where um, knowing a Spotify history from the just several months um, was as accurate as predicting the listener's personality as a coworker of that listener would be at predicting their personality. So there's these really direct links that we, we haven't been able to uh, really test before because of the lack of data. Um, on the other hand, then there's the extension to mental health um, and mental health status. We've been also working on that of understanding the link between musical preferences, musical performance, musical engagement, consumption, and, and mental health. And then ultimately that leads to how we can improve different uh, mental health conditions, which for as a psychologist wearing my psychologist hat is, is tremendously important, especially when we talk about trying to increase pro-social behavior and pro-social traits in the population. Uh, David, that's really interesting about how, you know, Spotify data, for example, can reveal some hidden truths about our personalities. Uh, and I believe there's an online project you've put together. It's called uh, Musical Universe and it's at www.musicaluniverse.io. And it's a platform for public engagement where anyone from around the world uh, can go and take personality and music tests and find out how they score in terms of their personality traits and musical preferences. And so far, there's about 250,000 people uh, who have completed the test. If, if you want, you can uh, say that you would like your data to be used for research or that it be anonymized and we're very transparent with the, with the data there. Fantastic. And this is you and your colleagues are actually doing the analysis behind the scenes. So they would be becoming part of your uh, study if they took part, yeah? It, um, only if they select. Some people like to do sure. it just to get the results, but then there's an option for um, the data anonymized and de-identified to be used uh, to help us in, in research, which has been a really incredible help to really start to map and understand personality and, and music and health and things like empathy across different cultures. Oh, that's wild. Okay, absolutely. I'll be going on there immediately after the podcast and uh, we will include the a link to that website in the show notes, of course. Uh, and Ruth, I believe that your PhD was about quite an unusual but very relevant subject. Uh, talk to us a bit about the overlap of uh, big hair and your PhD. <laughs> 
Yes, I studied uh, rock anthems for my PhD. Wow. But it was a way of writing about Queen. I'm obsessed with Queen. Um, I'm a collector. I love their albums. And I wanted to know what it was about Queen that I was fascinated by. And it was this idea that they could join people together through their anthems, so their anthemic songs. And very simply, you know, the idea of collectivity, using the pronoun we, we will rock you, we are the champions, giving somebody a means to participate through collective gesture, waving your arms in the air, clapping. My goodness, how rousing, how inspiring. And it just makes you feel great. And it's wonderful how now, you know, so many generations know Queen, it's gone around the world. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not specific to one culture, but it really does have musical qualities that everybody can sing along and everyone can join in. So the power of music is just right there in, in sort of anthems. You can always look at football anthems as well, chanting, get everyone singing along. But yeah, what a great way to feel included and part of something. Sean, coming over to yourself, you spoke a bit earlier about this concept of the JBL brand is very much youth orientated, so it has a certain sonic curve. What comes first in designing the character of the audio equipment? An iconic brand like like JBL, it's, it's over 75 years old. There's certain design language used to communicate what the brand is about. So I think the sound, generally, uh, all regardless of the brand, they aim for accurate sound. Uh, JBL, because it's youth oriented, uh, it's uh, has that extra bass and it has to play sufficiently loud. I think JBL is associated with professional sound, tours, cinemas, recording studios, so it has to play loud and have mm. sufficient bass. If you look at some of the other brands like Harman Kardon the luxury brand like Mark Levinson or Revel, there's certain design language in there to make it look and appeal to the demographic. So a Harman Kardon brand would have a nice design. It appeals to someone who's more professional, maybe older. It's got nice materials. Again, accuracy is the goal. And then when you go to a luxury brand like Mark Levinson, it has to look luxurious. It has to have clean lines. And there's really no excuse for the the best quality. So they really sweat the very last detail to make it measure accurately and sound accurate. And the same is true with Revel. So uh, there's there's no really limitation in price. So uh, you can make it sound really good. I'm going to keep that in mind next time I turn up my AKGs. I'm curious to know, have you seen any interesting differences in global cultures that kind of illustrate this link between music and sound curves and sound design and personalities and cultures? So we've done a lot of studies in different cultures, different countries, Japan, China, Germany, uh, the US, Canada, so on. And whenever the tests are done blind and we give people various options, it seems as though they all focus on the same thing, which is neutrality or accuracy. Uh, Even though there exists a lot of myths, that we, we hear uh, years ago in Japan, we were asked by Lexus to test Japanese taste because they believed Americans like lots and lots of bass compared to a Japanese consumer. So we did a study in Tokyo where we took in binaural recordings of speakers in rooms and, and the Japanese subjects could adjust the bass. And it turned out that they like uh, as much bass as Americans, which is not excessive, but certainly, you know, full. And mm. we came to the conclusion that uh, it's it's cultural that, uh, you know, we hardly sell any subwoofers in Japan. Uh, they live in high density housing and they're very uh, polite and they don't want to disturb their, their neighbors. But mm. when they go to cinemas or get in their cars and there's not the social context, uh, they like as much bass as everyone else. And when you, when you think about it, uh, they don't make multiple versions of recordings uh, for different geographic parts of the world. There's only one recording made of uh, Pavarotti. And when the late Pavarotti went to Japan to perform, they didn't tune the sound system or his voice differently. They wanted to hear the true sound of Pavarotti. So I think 
I think sound quality is universal, and that's why we make one product and sell it everywhere in the world. So next to also the the sound quality, there's also, I think what you mentioned was the actual preferences um, and and the listening behavior and styles and uh, across different cultures and the universal and variations in that. Um, And there's actually been a really interesting studies just in the past year um, from Sam Mayer at Harvard, um, Josh McDermott in MIT, um, Dr. Keltner um, at UC Berkeley, looking at music and emotions um, and perception of form and function. And they're finding that there's definitely certain elements of music that are universally perceived, um, but there are also variations in my own research with Jason Renfro uh, at Cambridge, we've been observing, at least within preferences, there's also universals and variations um, in the link between musical preferences and personality. One of the studies that I really like was from Josh McDermott that from a few years ago where he's been looking at a tribe from South America, from the Amazon, and seeing that preferences for dissonant and consonant music are much different than Western cultures. So there's a a shift um, and something which Ruth mentioned about earlier in terms of exposure in Western culture, what type of music we're exposed to, and that being um, a potentially very formative um, aspect of musical taste and preference. That's wild. Wow, very interesting. And David, there's this sort of nascent overlap between this world of big data and the understanding of who we are as people and the understanding of you know, the fundamental, the the primal role of music in our personalities and how we overlap as cultures and citizens of the world. Um, I believe you're working on a really interesting project, which is all about the power of music to bring people together. I'd love it if you can share some of the details with our listeners. I'd be happy to. Um, So if we look around the world right now, we're seeing the social fabric really in trouble. And we also, at the same time, see people yearning to try to connect through music, Um, even during the times of the pandemic going and and having different types of online concerts and musical gatherings together. And what we want to do, I've been working with uh, researchers from 15 different universities on a project called One World, One Song. And we're combining cutting edge leading research with grassroots movements that are on the ground. For example, there's groups in uh, Jerusalem and outside of Jerusalem that bring Arab and Jewish teenagers together through song and through singing. And there's groups really all around the world that are using music as a way to bridge divides and to engage in musical dialogue. And this we see as one of the things that can really move uh, initiatives forward to help these social divisions that are in place and to increase mutual understanding empathy, compassion, um, so that we could all be more humane to each other. Fantastic. Well, in my humble opinion, we cannot have enough of that kind of initiative to bring people together using the power of music. And I think that's a wonderfully optimistic and empathetic way to kind of round up our conversation today. But before we all say goodbye, I'd like to ask you one final question, which is, what song are you going to add to our wonderful title playlist for the audio talks series uh what song have you chosen and why have you chosen it so i'd like to start with your good self ruth i've chosen sam cook's a change is going to come i'd like to think i'm an optimist and i think that song gives us all hope and uh, it's as relevant today as it was back then wonderfully said very apropos of what we just heard from david there thank you speaking of which david what would be your contribution to the Audio Talks playlist and why? I would suggest the rendition of Home by the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. Um, it's by uh, the teenagers that I was mentioning before from East and West Jerusalem, who are really courageous individuals. They come together each week to make music and sing, and they put an incredible version of Home together. And there's also a music video, too, that's just out of this world. Oh, fantastic. We'll we'll link to the music video from the show notes and we'll absolutely include that very happily in the playlist. Thank you, David. And Sean, what slice of audio delight have you chosen for the title playlist? It's a recording by uh, Ella Fitzgerald and Oscar Peterson. It's just called Ella and Oscar. It was recorded in 1974 and uh, it's an album that I always reach when I need to uplift myself. I feel tired. I need energy. And just just the raw talent and the direct communication between Oscar and Ella is uh, 
it's phenomenal, of course, as as performers in the jazz idiom, it, it doesn't get any better. So the whole album is good. The song Mean to Me is the first track. And as soon as I hear the first notes, I just, my mood completely changes for the better. And my own contribution for the playlist is the New York Dolls with Personality Crisis, a glorious hot mess and precursor to the punk revolution of the 1970s. Thank you so much for joining us on the Audio Talks podcast, David, Ruth and Sean. Listeners, did you learn something interesting about your musical tastes or even about yourself? Feel free to share your thoughts via any of the Audio Talks social media channels or even via a podcast review. Join me again in two weeks for another great discussion with some more legends of audio. And don't forget to subscribe and tell all your friends about the Audio Talks podcast presented to you by Harmon. See you next time.